In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Today is a very great feast day. And there is, according to the Greek calendar, today the feast day of St. Catherine. But also, we have a switch between yesterday and today, between the feast of St. Clement and St. Clement of Rome and St. Catherine. And since it works out better for us at the Monastery of Tipicon, we have celebrated the Feast of St. Catherine yesterday, although we follow the Greek Tipicon, the Tipicon rather, of the Holy Mountain of Athos, the Tipicon which is more or less founded by St. Sava, of the Sanctified, which was given to the entire church, the basis, the backbone of the church's Tipicon, and so today we celebrate the Feast of St. Clement. St. Cyril and Methodius <coughs> were great saints of Thessalonica who would be called par excellence the missionaries. They were the equal to the apostles who did a tremendous work. But they had five disciples. And we know that a great deal of the work or perhaps even most of the work was done by their disciples, particularly the foremost of their disciples, who was Clement of Ochrid. St. Clement is called the wonder worker of Ochrid because together with St. Naum, among this seven, that is Cyril, Methodius, Clement, Naum, Goraz, Sava, and Gilari, Clement and Naum were known to be the wonder workers. They were the ones that were working miracles, great miracles. We know from the life of St. Clement that he worked so many miracles that just by his shadow alone, just like the apostle, great miracles would be worked. And this, <coughs> the work of these holy ones, these fathers, was so significant for the entire Orthodox Church because they worked to give the Slavic peoples not just the gospel, but even all literary usage of their language. And they worked to translate the holy books. And it all happened between Thessaloniki and Ochrid. And Thessaloniki was the crossroads between the Greek and the Slavic peoples. But we know from ancient historians that in the 5th and the 6th century, there was mass migration from the Carpathian Mountains. The Slavs came down to those areas. In fact, they went all the way through Greece, even down to the Peloponnesus. But there were so many in Thessalonica that he was reported to say that there were more Slavs than there were actual native Thessalonians. And so the, it was very important then for the church to help these people. And by the time of St. Cyr Methodius and their disciples, the Christianization of the Slavs was pretty much complete. They worshipped, however, in the Greek tongue, which they didn't understand. And so the fathers had a great desire to be able to present orthodoxy and the services of the church, which contain all the theology of the church, as we've said many times, to these people. Their work remains unto the ages, and just as it happens with a servant of Satan, somebody who's a bad person, someone who gives himself over to the devil, someone who works for the evil one, any time anyone utilizes the tools of their work, it hurts their soul, even unto eternity. And those works which have been done by these saints on behalf of the entire Slavic peoples continues to be a cause of rejoicing for them because the sole purpose was to preach Christ. <clears throat> 
And at first, they had what was called the glagolithic script, which was more or less figuratures. And then the disciples, that is St. Clement, with 3,500 students, worked on translating the scriptures with the Cyrillic alphabet, which was based upon the Greek alphabet. And then there are certain words, there are certain sounds in the Slavic language which they don't have in the Greek language. Some letters were added. The Gospel of St. John was translated in the very first service, which was conducted in the Slavic language. It was done in no other place but Thessaloniki, in the Church of St. Demetrius, on the feast day of St. Demetrius. In honor of the efforts of these holy men, they had the service that year done exclusively in the Slavonic tongue in the Church of St. Demetrius in Thessaloniki. Back in those days, they didn't have the political ideas, positions, sensitivities that they have now. In fact, the Byzantine, Roman, Greek Empire was very happy and proud of their Slavic peoples, and they were particularly happy over the fact that these people were so integrated into the culture and became one with the Greek Empire. But St. Photius the Great, who was the patriarch of Constantinople, was so happy and so sensitive, particularly about Bulgaria. He considered himself the father, the spiritual father of this nation. And there were no separations as they have today, separations which were of course, influenced by the evil spirits. And the work of these fathers was for the entire Slavic world. They would not have liked to see separations among the Slavic peoples today either. They worked for all the Slavic peoples, and so the Russian nation was ready. In 988, Bulgaria was ready. Serbia had invited everything. Pannonia, Moravia. We're talking about a huge, great thing which happened to the entire Christian church. Never were there so many multitudes of any one type or group of people coming into the church like this. This was phenomenal. And so <laughs> their work as we hear in the scriptures, their sound hath gone forth into all the earth and the words unto the ends of the world. We hear concerning the apostles, but they were equal to the apostles, and so their work definitely went throughout the entire world. Back in those days, the differences between the, the language of the different Slavic peoples was not so pronounced as it is today. Although... <laughs> If you have a, a base, as a basis a Slavic language, it would be easier if you're exposed and you study. It would be easier for you to learn another Slavic language. Back in those days, it would have been a lot more easier for them to comprehend each other. So the books that were written and sent all the way to Russia were translated according to the dialect of the Thessalonian Slavs, of the people of that area. And so this is why we say that <coughs> these saints were actually the connection between the Greek and the Slavic peoples. And this area was the place where it, it was centralized between Thessaloniki and the city of Ochrid, which was called, which is considered the Jerusalem of all the Slavs. In that city where St. Clement is buried, in the church of St. Clement, in the church of St. Pandadaimon, whom he had a special love for. There were 365 churches, one church for every day of the year. And some of the churches <clears throat> were quite loved and respected and cherished and honored by the local inhabitants. For example, there's one church called St. Nicholas the Hospital, and people would go there and pray to St. Nicholas, and he worked on abundant miracles. 
during the time of the Spanish uh, flu. Many of the inhabitants of Ocre were sick, and they thought to take out the relics of St. Clement, and they took out the relics in procession around the entire city, and the next day, everyone was fine. Everyone was healed. Continuously, the saint works great miracles. And so he has almost become unknown to the Greek people. But it wasn't like that centuries ago. He is a saint not only for the Slavs, but also for the Greeks, and also for all, for all the Christians. And so in the Archdiocese of Ohrid, which was considered a very special diocese, they had great love for the saint. And the Archdiocese of Ohrid was a very important archdiocese in the Orthodox Church, very close to the Mother Church in Constantinople. In fact, oftentimes the Archbishop would come from Constantinople, like Theophylact. There are commentaries that are translated by people which were written by Theophylact of Bulgaria or Theophylact of Okrid. He was the protosingulus of the patriarch. He would be the one that would actually write the sermons for the patriarch. And he was appointed Archbishop of Okrid. Another famous Archbishop was Dimitrios Homatian, Homatianos, who was the one who wrote and composed a great part of the service that we, chant of Saint Cla- that we chanted last night. As I've said many times before, we have to come to know our saints. And here <coughs> in our monastery, we've seen the aid so many times which, came, which has come to us from St. Clement of Ocrid. We have his holy relic. We see the power of his relics and his prayers. And so this is, this is why we have a veneration. The veneration should spread throughout the metropolis. And we should promote the saints of God. And we should come to know them. And we should discover them. And we will find in them great helpers who will be able to grant unto us the aid that we need in this life. The saints stood for a number of different causes, and they were imprisoned. They defended the Orthodox faith against the Filioque, but they also defended the fact that, according to Orthodox doctrine, people must understand the services. This is something which is known and felt and understood among the Orthodox Christians. We must have an understanding. And so this was what they were fighting for. And they were put in prison for this cause. And they presented their case in Rome because at that time the church was united. And they were put in prison by the Germans and the Frankish heretics. The saints considered them heretics because they preached what the saints would call the trilingual heresy, the three-language heresy. <clears throat> These people believe that you could only worship in three languages as if they were a holy language. There's no such thing as a holy language. If you're Orthodox, we know that. But they believe that you could only worship in three languages because on the cross of Christ, at the crucifix, there were three inscriptions in three different languages, Greek, Latin, and Hebrew. So they said you can worship either in Greek or in Hebrew or in Latin, but no other language. It would be considered a sin. And so the whole existence of these saints was against that. And where did it all happen, as we said? In Thessaloniki. And in those areas, they, were, they taught and it was accepted by the patriarch and by among all of the Orthodox Christians, that we should understand what we are saying in church. Oftentimes, language issues become sensitive issues in parishes. And people become accustomed to hearing Greek or Slavonic. 
And so they like to hear it just because they're accustomed to hear it. But when you put them to the test, they don't really understand, and they're losing. And we know, as you, many of you, the monastics, have heard me say many times, that sometimes one little phrase in the service can change a person's life. We read that <clears throat> in the book of The Way of a Pilgrim. He heard something in church, and it put a flame in him. Pray without ceasing. But he's not the only one. And oftentimes, whenever our hearts are ready, something at some point will jump out and speak to us. Just a few months ago, I was in one of our parishes. There's only really one parish that serves almost all in Greek. And I did some of the exclamations in English. And someone walked into church while I was saying, take, eat, this is my body, drink ye all of it, this is my blood. And he was shaken by the whole thing. And he, he was so taken aback, he said, that's what's going on? That's what's happening? And some people are chanting for years and they have no idea what they're chanting. This is sinful. If somebody wants to pray in Greek or in Slavonic, they're obligated to learn the language. There's no problem with praying in those languages. In fact, there's a great beauty in praying in those languages. There's no doubt about that. The Greek language was the language chosen for the Gospels. It was baptized, and it was the first language that was used in the church. And then concerning the Slavonic language, I don't know if there's any other language that was made, promoted solely for the Christian purpose. The whole purpose of its existence is missionary and Christian. So with much prayer, all those translations were done. And there's a beauty in all that, definitely. But one is obligated to learn the language. If he's going to pray in that language, he must learn, and he must understand what he's saying. When the saints were in prison, they said the prayer of the third hour, which is a very beautiful prayer. O Lord, who at the third hour did send the now Holy Spirit upon thine, thine apostles, thine, thine disciples, take him not away from us, but renew him in us, who pray unto thee. Many of you will hear me say, don't underestimate the power of prayer. When we say our prayers, they are definitely heard. Whether our prayers are accepted is another issue. But when we pray for a renewal of the grace of the Holy Spirit, we will receive the Holy Spirit. We will receive a renewal. And when they said this prayer in prison, the chains fell off them. This prayer is often repeated at the time of the Epiclesis, at the time of the consecration of the Holy Gifts among many of the Slavic people and the Romanian peoples. And it's a beautiful prayer in the life of St. John of Cranston. and it says by the time he finished the third prayer, because there are two verses in between the prayers, it's repeated three times, St. John would be on fire. Remember the spirit of the law. And so the verses in between are, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Indeed, according to the words of St. Seraphim and Saraf, this is the purpose of our life, to achieve the Holy Spirit, to have the Holy Spirit within us. We change as people if we have the Holy Spirit in us. How many times have we felt that grace of God that is the Holy Spirit. How many times have we felt us block that grace of God? Those are, those are the demons. But it's not really the demons per se, it's us permitting the demons. So when they said those prayers, the shackles uh, fell off of them. At the Epiclesis then, oftentimes, even on Mount Athos, in some places, they say this prayer of the third hour. And not too long ago, there was a 
parchment, a manuscript that was found in, Thessalon in Thessaloniki from the 11th century of the divine liturgy with this prayer inserted also. So at the 11th century, we know that it was also prayed at those parts. And the saints continued their work throughout the Slavic world. Particularly, at that time, Bulgaria was becoming more of an uh, established, independent country. And they had two types of peoples. There in Bulgaria, they had the Slavs, and they also had people which came from the east, <coughs> Turkic tribes. And so they had different languages, and because of the work of St. Cyril Methodius and their disciples, the official language of that country became Slavonic. And then the saints did a lot of work for that country as well. And so here we have the saint, as we said, the foremost disciple of Saints Cyril Methodius, the greatest, who is the wonder worker, who is their leader, who was, we know from the life, closest to Saint Methodius. Probably he was with Saint Methodius from a very young age, and he followed Saint Methodius like Timothy did Paul, we heard in the canon last night. <clears throat> and a good disciple always receives the grace and blessings of his elder. Sometimes he can even become greater than his elder. So today let us all pray to St. Clement of Okri, the great father, who has great boldness before the Lord, that he establish us, that he make us firm, in Greek, whenever anybody moves forward in any ecclesiastical step, if he becomes a monk or a clergyman, usually the blessing would be to say stereomenos, which means established or firm. Because this is a very this is a very good blessing, especially in our days, because there's a lot of imbalance and people aren't as dedicated as they should be to whatever it is that they need to be. They're not stable. So in him we can find stability, and we should pray that we all be established and stable in our call, in our calling as Orthodox Christians, as monastics, as clergy, wherever it is that the Lord has put us, and that we may be deemed worthy to follow the will of the Master Jesus Christ. We can look at them as great examples and understand the great legacy which they have left for us and understand how great they are in the eyes of the church, of the entire Catholic church, since multitudes change their lives because of the work of these holy people. So since they preached that we should understand what we are saying when we worship Christ, we should add the other thing that they stressed, that we need to connect with those words, feel those words. If our hearts are not ready with the Lord, we will be indifferent to all these things that we hear. If our heart is ready, as it says in scriptures, ready is my heart, O Lord, ready is my heart, many of the verses that you will hear in the services of the church will jump out to you. They will mean something to you. They will penetrate into your hearts. And that's exactly what the saints knew and what they wanted people to know. And that is what we want people to know. If we come to church unprepared, those deep and profound words which we hear will not penetrate into us as they should. And all these words, these prayers, these teachings which we hear in church enter into our understanding, into our minds, into our hearts according as we are able to receive. For this reason, 
we hear the same thing often in church with the hopes that at some point, whatever it is that we hear will finally pen penetrate, will finally get it. But let us not be distracted. We always need to remind ourselves, especially when we're in church and in the Divine Liturgy, to collect our mind, to collect our thoughts, so that we can understand and so that we can feel and pray, so that we can actually understand the blessed presence of the holy angels that are here with us and the saints that are here with us, and particularly today, the host of our feast, Saint Clement of Ochrid. By his holy intercessions, may the Lord grant unto all of us stability, humility, love for God, love for the services of the church, love for prayer, <coughs> love for our Lord and God and Savior Jesus Christ, to whom is due glory, honor, and worship unto the ages of ages. Amen.